Enzymes are large proteins with complex three-dimensional shapes stabilized by interactions between their amino acids. Each enzyme has its own unique shape with ridges and pockets. Regions of the enzyme active in catalyzing a reaction are called active sites. The enzyme, in this case having two active sites, is approached by two substrates, substrate A and substrate B. The two substrates fit into the active sites, forming an enzyme substrate complex. As the complex disassociates, a piece of the original substrate A is now part of substrate B, creating two new products, product C and product D. The original enzyme remains unchanged by the interaction. In review, the concept is represented by the equation shown here. Reactants A and B are transformed through interaction with the enzyme to produce products C and D, leaving the original enzyme unchanged. In order to illustrate the basic concept of osmosis, begin with a transparent container full of water. The container is divided in half by a semi-permeable membrane that allows only water to pass through. Unequal quantities of solute are added to both sides. The solution on the left is more dilute and the solution on the right is more concentrated. In other words, the ratio of water molecules to solute molecules is greater on the left than on the right. This means that more water molecules will travel through the membrane from left to right than in the opposite direction. Since the membrane is permeable only to water, the molecules of solute cannot pass through. Because osmosis affects not only the concentrations of solutions, but also the volumes, we will further illustrate the process of osmosis. Again, we start with a container of water divided in half by a semi-permeable membrane. In this case, the membrane can move from side to side. Glucose is added to both sides, but not in equal amounts. The concentration on the left is 180 grams per liter, and on the right the concentration is 360 grams per liter. Water flows through the membrane predominantly in the direction of higher glucose concentration and the movable membrane adjusts in order to accommodate this influx of water. This continues until the ratio of water molecules to glucose molecules is the same on both sides. The volume of solution on the two sides is now unequal. The volume on the left has been decreased by one-third and the volume on the right has been increased by one-third. The concept of osmotic pressure can be illustrated using a similar apparatus. Starting again with a container of water divided by a movable semi-permeable membrane, a rod is introduced that prevents the membrane from moving. Glucose is added to one side only. Again, the ratio of water to solute is higher on the left than on the right. In fact, there is only water on the left. Water rushes into the compartment on the right, but the membrane is not allowed to move, preventing a change in volume. The force needed to keep the volume from changing is the osmotic pressure. So far, only one solute at a time has been added to the container of water. What happens if fructose, as well as glucose, is added to one side, but only glucose is added to the other? In this case, the total number of molecules added is the same on both sides. Therefore, the ratio of water molecules to solute molecules is equal. Water does move back and forth through the membrane, but the movement is not predominantly in one direction. Therefore, the volume of the two compartments remains the same. Again, two different solutes will be used. Glucose is added to one side and sodium chloride is added to the other. Both sides contain one molal solution. 
However, each molecule of sodium chloride ionizes in water, yielding one sodium ion and one chloride ion. Therefore, the ratio of water to solute is higher on the left than on the right. Water will rush into the compartment on the right until the ratio of water to solute is equal on both sides. The membrane moves, changing the volume of the two compartments. Neither the glucose nor the sodium chloride can pass through the membrane, but the movement of water from left to right has changed their concentration. In review, the net flow of water across a semi-permeable membrane is determined by the ratio of water molecules to solute molecules. The chemical nature of the solute is unimportant unless it ionizes in water. If it ionizes, the number of solute molecules will be increased. Any difference in the ratio of water to solute will cause a movement of water across the semipermeable membrane. The osmotic pressure can be measured as the force required to keep the membrane from moving. Embedded through the cell wall are carrier proteins that allow the passage of materials from one side of the cell membrane to the other. Within the carrier protein is a binding or recognition site. In order for certain ions and molecules to pass through the cell membrane, they must first attach themselves to the binding site of a carrier protein. In this case, we are seeing a calcium ion, which is to pass from an area of lower calcium concentration to an area of higher calcium concentration. This requires an input of energy through the process of active transport. The binding of calcium to the recognition site stimulates the breakdown of ATP, releasing a phosphate group. This results in the phosphorylation of the carrier protein causing it to change shape, thereby releasing the calcium ion to the opposite side of the cell membrane. In review, in active transport, an ion or molecule binds to the recognition site of its specific carrier protein. This is followed by the splitting of a molecule of ATP and the phosphorylation of the membrane carrier protein. This causes the carrier protein to change shape and to release the ion or molecule to the other side of the cell membrane. The cell is separated from its surroundings by a cell membrane. Within the semifluid cytoplasm are membrane-bound organelles. These include lysosomes, the Golgi apparatus, vesicles, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and finally the nucleus, which is surrounded by a nuclear membrane. Proteins synthesized by ribosomes in the rough endoplasmic reticulum are incorporated into vesicles and transported to the cisterni of the Golgi apparatus for further processing. As the protein makes its way from one part of the Golgi apparatus to another, a segment of the protein may be removed. A carbohydrate or lipid may be added. Mature proteins destined for secretion by the cell are again wrapped in a membranous envelope. These vesicles make their way to the cell membrane. The membranes fuse and proteins are secreted. Not all proteins processed by the Golgi apparatus are secreted. Some are packaged into organelles called lysosomes. These organelles generally stay within the cell and the enzymes they contain are used for intracellular digestion. In review, Proteins are synthesized by ribosomes in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and incorporated into vesicles. These vesicles transport the proteins to the Golgi apparatus for further processing. Proteins destined for secretion are packaged into vesicles that fuse with the cell membrane, 
releasing the proteins to the cell exterior. Other proteins are incorporated into lysosomes. These stay within the cell and are involved in intracellular digestion. Electron transport begins with a substrate which can be the product of glycolysis or the Krebs cycle. The substrate is represented as an S with two bound hydrogen atoms. The substrate and hydrogen atoms share two electrons. The substrate is oxidized losing both the hydrogen atoms and the shared electrons. At the same time NAD is oxidized and transfers a pair of electrons to the electron transport system. The hydrogen ions are not transported along the cytochromes but are used in a later reaction. The pair of electrons is transported to flavin mononucleotide abbreviated as FMN and FMN is reduced. The electrons lose energy as they are transferred to FMN and this energy is absorbed by an ADP phosphorylation reaction that produces ATP. Reduced FMN gives up the electrons to coenzyme Q. Coenzyme Q shuttles electrons to the first in a series of cytochromes beginning with cytochrome B. Cytochromes contain an iron atom which accepts and donates electrons. As electrons are passed from cytochrome B to cytochrome C1, the released energy is again harnessed by the phosphorylation of ADP. Cytochrome C shuttles electrons to cytochrome A. The transfer of electrons from cytochrome A to cytochrome A3 generates another ATP. The final electron acceptor in the series is oxygen. One oxygen atom combines with two hydrogen ions and two electrons to produce water. In review, the electron transport system uses a series of carriers to gradually lower the energy level of electrons lost by the substrate when it is oxidized. This energy is harnessed during the phosphorylation of ADP producing ATP. FAD, an electron carrier, is reduced to FADH2 during the Krebs cycle. This carrier enters the electron transport chain by transferring electrons to coenzyme Q. We see a general drop in available energy like water flowing over a series of waterfalls as the electrons are transferred from one carrier to another. Using this analogy, at each cascade, the energy of falling water is used to perform a task which is the synthesis of ATP. At rest, the cell membrane of an axon is electrically charged so that the inside is negatively charged with respect to the outside. The electrical charge difference between the inside and outside of the cell is approximately minus 70 millivolts and is called the resting membrane potential. The resting membrane potential is maintained by a specific distribution of ions inside and outside of the cell. There are more sodium ions outside the membrane than inside. The opposite is true for potassium ions. There are more inside the cell than outside. A depolarizing stimulus changes the ion permeability of the cell membrane. The stimulus causes voltage-sensitive sodium channels to open which allows sodium ions to rush into the cell. The inside of the cell becomes more positive 
and the cell membrane depolarizes. After a slight time delay, the depolarization of the cell membrane causes the opening of voltage-sensitive potassium channels. The positively charged potassium ions diffuse out of the cell. Because the potassium ions are positively charged and diffuse out of the cell, the inside of the cell membrane becomes less positive. This is the process of repolarization. The voltage-sensitive sodium channels close during repolarization. This rapid sequence of events involving the depolarization and repolarization of the cell membrane is called an action potential. Sodium ions are pumped out of the cell and potassium ions are brought in by active transport. The resting membrane potential is re-established very quickly. A myelinated axon is characterized by the presence of a discontinuous myelin sheath made by Schwann cells. Regions where the cell membrane is exposed to the surrounding fluid are called nodes. A nerve impulse travels rapidly through the myelinated portion of the axon and causes voltage-sensitive channels to open at the node. Positively charged sodium ions diffuse into the axon and an action potential is generated. The nerve impulse travels rapidly through the axon and generates an action potential at the next node. Transmitting a nerve impulse electrically through the myelinated regions greatly increases the speed of the impulse since an action potential which relies on the flow of ions must only be generated at the nodes. In review, a stimulus traveling along an axon triggers the opening of voltage-sensitive sodium channels. Positively charged sodium ions rush into the axon. The inside of the cell becomes more positively charged and the cell membrane is depolarized. Voltage-sensitive potassium channels open and allow potassium ions to leave the cell, thus repolarizing the membrane. This depolarization and subsequent repolarization of the cell membrane is called the action potential. Once begun, an action potential propagates itself and travels along the nerve axon. Any change in the relative distribution of sodium and potassium ions that may occur during this process is counteracted by active transport, which moves sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions in. Although impulses travel rapidly in this manner, their speed is greatly increased by the presence of a myelin sheath. Where present, this sheath insulates the axon and the impulse is transmitted electrically through the cytoplasm. An action potential is generated only at the nodes and so the impulse seems to jump from node to node along the myelinated axon. At rest, the cell membrane of a neuron is electrically charged so that the inside is negatively charged with respect to the outside. The electrical charge difference between the inside and outside of the cell is approximately minus 70 millivolts and is called the resting membrane potential. A threshold stimulus depolarizes the cell and the membrane potential becomes less negative approaching threshold level. Once the threshold potential is reached, the cell membrane undergoes a sudden change in ion permeability, which causes an accelerated depolarization and initiates an action potential. The self-propagating action potential travels along the axon away from the cell body. A sub-threshold stimulus depolarizes the cell, but the membrane potential does not reach threshold level. The cell returns to the resting membrane potential without initiating an action potential. 
A series of subthreshold stimuli can have an additive effect to depolarize the membrane potential to threshold level. This temporal summation can initiate an action potential. Subthreshold stimuli arriving simultaneously in adjacent regions of the dendrites can also have an additive effect to depolarize the membrane potential to threshold level. This spatial summation can also initiate an action potential. In review, an action potential can only be initiated in a neuron when the membrane potential depolarizes to threshold level. This occurs in several ways. One strong threshold stimulus can depolarize the membrane to threshold level. A series of subthreshold stimuli can have an additive effect to depolarize the membrane to threshold level. This is called temporal summation. Similarly, several subthreshold stimuli arriving simultaneously to the neuron can have an additive effect to depolarize the membrane to threshold level. This is called spatial summation. A nerve impulse traveling from the presynaptic axon terminal to the postsynaptic neuron must cross a small space called the synaptic cleft. The presynaptic terminal contains acetylcholine-filled vesicles. When an action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal, it stimulates voltage-sensitive calcium channels. These channels open allowing calcium ions to flow into the terminal. The calcium ions activate enzymes which in turn facilitate the fusion of vesicles with the cell membrane. Acetylcholine is released. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft where it binds to the receptor sites of chemically gated channels in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. The chemically gated channels open and sodium ions rush into the cell, slightly depolarizing the membrane. Potassium ions are also allowed to flow out, but fewer potassium ions than sodium ions diffuse across the membrane. It is important that the synaptic cleft is cleared of all acetylcholine molecules so that the postsynaptic neuron isn't continually stimulated. The acetylcholine molecules are broken down by acetylcholine esterase, an enzyme found in the cell membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. In addition, acetylcholine does not permanently bind to the channels, and these molecules must also be inactivated. In review, upon reaching the terminal end of the neuron, an action potential opens voltage-sensitive channels that allow calcium ions to flow into the cell. These ions activate enzymes that in turn facilitate the fusion of vesicles containing acetylcholine with the cell membrane. In this way, acetylcholine is released. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to chemically gated channels in the cell membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. The channels open, allowing primarily sodium ions to flow into the cell. Acetylcholine is inactivated by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. In the eye, the transparent lens is held in position by a large number of strong but delicate fibers which together form the suspensory ligament. These in turn are connected to the ciliary muscle. The lens is quite elastic and has a globular shape at rest. When the ciliary muscles are relaxed, the suspensory ligaments are pulled taut. The fibers then pull on the edges of the lens, making it thin. Distant objects are now in focus since the rays of light reaching the eye from these objects are virtually parallel 
and require a little bending by the lens to converge to a focal point on the retina of the eye. As an object draws near, the rays of light begin to diverge. As they pass through the lens, they converge to a focal point behind the retina. The object is no longer in focus. The eye brings the object back into focus by contracting the ciliary muscles, which decreases the tension on the suspensory ligaments. The lens thickens and its refractive power is increased. The divergent rays of light are bent to converge to a focal point on the retina. The object is again in focus. As a review, we will see what happens when the object moves away from the eye. Again, the rays of light are almost parallel when they reach the eye. The lens is thick and it bends these rays so that they converge to a focal point in front of the retina. The object is out of focus. The ciliary muscles relax, pulling the suspensory ligament taut, and the lens is drawn thin. The focal point is moved to the back of the eye, and the object is in focus. If the object is moved closer, the eye will accommodate by contracting the ciliary muscles, decreasing the tension on the suspensory ligament, and allowing the lens to assume a more globular shape. The rays of light will now converge to a focal point at the back of the eye. Steroid hormones are attached to a carrier protein and travel in the bloodstream to their target cells. The hormone dissociates from the carrier protein and passes through the cell membrane. It binds to a cytoplasmic receptor protein within the cell. This hormone receptor protein complex translocates to the nucleus and attaches to the chromatin at an acceptor site. This activates specific genes and begins the process of transcription. The newly transcribed messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and is translated into proteins. These proteins may be enzymes, for example, that will change the metabolism of the target cell in a specific way and produce the steroid hormone response. In review, steroid hormones reach their target cells by attaching to a carrier protein. They dissociate from the carrier protein, pass through the cell membrane, and attach to a cytoplasmic receptor protein in the target cell. The hormone receptor protein complex translocates to the nucleus where it binds to an acceptor site on the chromatin, stimulating genetic transcription. The messenger RNA is translated into proteins. The action of these proteins produces the steroid hormone response. Like steroid hormones, thyroxin, or T4, travels in the bloodstream attached to a carrier protein. In this case, thyroxin binding globulin, or TBG. When it reaches its target cell, the hormone dissociates from the carrier protein and passes through the cell membrane. Once inside, T4 is converted to T3 by the binding protein. T3 enters the nucleus of the target cell and binds to a nuclear receptor protein already attached to the chromatin. This activates specific genes and begins the process of transcription. Newly transcribed messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and serves as a template for protein synthesis. These proteins are directly responsible for producing the thyroid hormone response. In review, the carrier protein TBG carries thyroxin or T4. The hormone dissociates from its carrier and diffuses through the cell membrane. The binding protein converts T4 to T3, which enters the nucleus. 
the hormone binds to a nuclear receptor protein attached to the chromatin and activates specific genes. Messenger RNA is produced and leaves the nucleus. Messenger RNA is translated into proteins and these proteins produce the thyroid hormone response. Unlike steroid and thyroid hormones, some hormones cannot pass through the target cell's membrane. Therefore, they are unable to exert their effects directly within the target cell. Instead, the hormone bonds to a receptor on the outer surface of the cell membrane, causing a change in the receptor protein. This change activates the enzyme adenylate cyclase. This enzyme converts ATP into cyclic AMP and two inorganic phosphates. Cyclic AMP acts as a second messenger by removing the inhibitory subunit of a protein kinase. The activated kinase produces the hormone effects. Cyclic AMP will continue to activate protein kinase by binding to the inhibitory subunit until CAMP is hydrolyzed by phosphodiesterase. In review, unlike steroid and thyroid hormones, which pass through the cell membrane of their target cells, water-soluble hormones must exert their effects indirectly by bonding to receptor proteins on the outside of the cells. These receptor proteins activate adenylin cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Protein kinases are activated by the removal of an inhibitory subunit by cyclic AMP. The protein kinase produces the hormone effects. Cyclic AMP is quickly inactivated by the enzyme phosphodiesterase. The human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, consists of a pair of RNA molecules plus the enzyme reverse transcriptase, surrounded by a protein coat and covered by a membrane derived from a host cell. Glycoproteins extend out from the membrane. The glycoproteins are recognized by the host cell and facilitate fusion of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. Once inside the host cell, the virus loses its protein coat and its RNA is used to synthesize DNA by the reverse transcriptase. First, a single strand of DNA is generated and serves as a template for the synthesis of its complementary strand. The double-stranded C DNA enters the host cell's nucleus and is integrated into the host's DNA. The viral genes are transcribed into RNA, which leaves the nucleus. Messenger RNA directs viral protein synthesis, producing the protein coats, glycoproteins, and reverse transcriptase that will become part of the new virus. Assembly occurs within the host cell and the surrounding membrane is acquired when the virus buds off. From the infection of one HIV virus, several new virus cells can be created. In review, the HIV genome is encoded in two strands of RNA. These strands, along with the enzyme reverse transcriptase, are surrounded by two protein coats plus a membrane derived from the host cell. Glycoproteins protruding from the membrane are recognized by the host cell. The membranes of the virus and host fuse, releasing viral particles into the host cell. The viral RNA is used to synthesize C-DNA by reverse transcriptase. 
the double-stranded C DNA moves into the nucleus and is integrated into the host's DNA. This DNA is transcribed into RNA, which leaves the nucleus and directs the synthesis of viral proteins. The new virus is assembled within the host, and as it buds off, the virus acquires its outer membrane. From the infection of one HIV virus, several new viruses can be created.